I'm a particle theorist, and that means that I'm supposed to be thinking deep thoughts. In reality, there's a whole range of different uh, activities. I spend a lot of time with experimenters, talking to them about the experiments to be done, the data they have in hand, how to think about things differently, and what to make of the results that they have. And so there's a lot of consultation. When I'm here at CERN, uh, some part of the time is spent being stimulated or trying to stimulate people in conversation, and the rest hiding away and trying to do calculations or write things that will be useful to people. So it's a life of the mind. Right. But what is it that is your goal? I mean, what, what's, what's a particle physicist trying to do? Well, basically we're trying to understand the universe and how it works. And it's a process that happens step by step. We, uh, you know, ever since Galileo, instead of simply thinking deep thoughts about deep questions, we try to pose questions that we can actually answer and then take those answers and put them together into something that's meaningful. So in all of science, but especially in physics and in particle physics, which we like to think of being on the edge, uh, we don't settle for individual explanations of different phenomena. We like to have a story that uh, covers many things at the same time. So step by step, we're trying to understand uh, more and more about how the universe works. So could you summarize a little bit what has happened in the last, say, 100 years of this? I mean, in a very, very brief way, of course, but uh, you know, if you could just tell us a very brief history of where we started and where we are at right now. One of the most exciting things about our subject is that it is so new. So people often say, well, the notion of atoms, particles, went back to the Greeks 2,500 years ago. But in fact, nobody believed that for a long time. That was an argument by assertion and poetry rather than evidence. So in my public lectures, I often show a picture of me at the age of three or four with my Polish grandparents, because they were alive at a time when people did not believe that atoms were real. So I have known people who existed before atoms were real. And it wasn't just because the physicists of that time and the chemists were thick, it's because they demanded evidence. And one of the challenges about atoms, even more a challenge for what we do, is that you can't see the particles. You can't hold them in your hands. The atoms, we always say, are small in their own light. If you look at them in visible light, you can't see them. The light just goes, goes sailing by. And so it wasn't until experiments done around 1908 or so in Paris by Jean Perrin, uh, who saw the motion of particles moved by molecules, something called Brownian motion, and used formulas derived by Einstein a few years before in 1905 to actually measure the size and the mass of individual atoms and prove that they were there. So the beginning is not within my memory, but within the memory of people that I, I have known once upon a time. And what we're doing now here at uh, the LHC and in other experiments, say at my lab, at Fermilab, are subjects that didn't exist when I was a graduate student. I mean, that's the thing. Every year, every, every day almost, there's something new to think about. So you, thought, you, you, you touched on a very important point, which is that um, knowledge is always moving on, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so when we talk about particle physics, you know, we, we do want to kind of get to an answer in terms of what is the world made of, mm -hmm. right? And so a tough question is, can we ever get to the answer? So the sad truth is that I don't actually care about that. What I care about is progress. So I, I understand the desire to have the final theory. Uh, you know, this was a dream we're told, at least in the, the uh, popular retellings, Einstein had the idea that uh, someday you would find an equation. It was so restrictive that everything would fall together like a trap. There could be a one and only one world, and that's the way it is, and everything would be understood. Well, maybe that will happen, maybe it won't. I think it's kind of a naive dream. My aspiration as a scientist is to learn something all the time, to get closer and closer uh, to understanding of a broader range of phenomena. And one of the things that we've learned I think it's, this is true through scientific history, but we see it in my own lifetime, my own career, that questions that once started out as, um, say, metaphysical questions become within the range of scientific questions. Some of them we can even answer. So I'll give you one example. Uh, when I was growing up, the proton had a certain mass. It has the same mass today. It was just given by you know, creators of the universe or something like that. 
you couldn't ask, where does it come from? Could it be different? How do we understand it? Now we know where that comes from. And it is, uh, it's quite fascinating because unlike every kind of matter that we've known before, you and me, the chairs, even the sky around us, where the mass of an object is equal to the sum of the masses of the parts, that's not the case for the proton. The proton is made more or less of three quarks and then some other stuff flying around. But if you add up the masses of the quarks, they're less than 10% of the mass of the proton, probably a, a good deal less. And that mass is really coming from the energy stored up and holding those quarks into a tiny volume. And uh, it, so it's really the embodiment of another Einstein idea, the idea that the mass of an object is equal to its rest energy, its energy at rest, divided by the speed of light squared. And so the little irony is that uh, the rest energy of the proton comes from the energy of motion of all the little guys running around inside. We now not only know that from our experiments, but we can do calculations that basically start with nothing and give us that understanding. So we now understand it could have been different. If we change this or that, it might have, uh, might have been different. And that's a real uh, example of, of the kind of progress that, that comes about that's a problem we solved almost before we knew it was a problem we could solve, but it's very recent. Yeah. So a lot of people, when they, when they think about particle physics, they always say, okay, where does it stop? I mean, can you just keep cutting things down to smaller and smaller sizes? Or is there a place where everything is going to come to the very bottom, you know, and we have the fundamental constituents of nature? Well, that's a good question, and we don't know whether the buck stops. Uh, every time we do experiments at higher energies, so the ones that are being done in the building behind us, or analyzed in the building behind us just now, uh, when we change energies, go to higher energies, we get a closer look at things, and one of the first things we do is to see if there's any evidence of internal structure of the things that for our generation, tentatively, always provisionally, we take to be elementary particles, structureless, indivis indivisible, with no size, the size of a geometrical point, if you like. Uh, we tried maybe 20 years ago, there was a great wave of theoretical activity trying to make up stories about what might be inside the quarks and the particles like the electron and to deduce the properties that we, we measure for them from some scheme. And people did a lot of clever stuff, but we never got anything more out than we put in, so that fails the test of a theory. The good theories that we have always give us back much more than we put into them. So, I mean, would you agree with the following statement, that uh, the way we understand nature depends very much on the way we look at nature, that is, on the tools that we have to explore the world. So, basically, you know, when we had the, uh, particle accelerators that were not as powerful as the LHC, mm -hmm. we couldn't see as much as we can see now, right? right? So. So is that something that you're comfortable with, that you, we only can see as far as our machines allow us to see? Well, it's a combination. It's, uh, th it's all about extending our senses. And we can do that either by having ideas or by building instruments that allow us to see, see in different ways. And the whole progress of science is tied up in both of those things. Changing perspectives, not being stuck in a rigid way of thinking, not accepting authority trying different things, always with the test of experiment, and devising instruments that allow us to see things in new and different ways. Uh, in cosmology, which is a subject favored to you, uh, to which you've devoted a lot of time, it's a lot like paleontology. In paleontology, there are only a few levels of the fossil record that are preserved and that we've learned to read. And the same is true in cosmology when there are a few moments, a few instants or periods, epochs as astronomers like to call them, where we've learned to read the evidence and make something of it. And in the last 20 years, thanks to new instruments in astronomy, we've been able to see a few more of those fossil layers, if you like, and make something of them. And I think it's quite wonderful that, uh, that we can expand our, our senses. The other thing I would say about this is that uh, we are of a certain size, you know, roughly one meter or a couple of meters in size. And yet we have learned since the dawn of quantum mechanics in the 1920s that if we want to understand why the chairs are solid, why the metal gleams, 
we have to take ourselves to a different place a billion times smaller, the world of the atoms. And what, we've, what our ancestors learned is that the laws of nature are different there, and that we find some difficulty explaining them to, a, to us or to other people in terms of our everyday experience. But if you're a better traveler, a better tourist, and you're willing to, uh, to take seriously the customs of the place, then you find it makes perfect sense. It's sort of like learning a foreign language or a foreign culture. If you bring, try to impose your own experiences on it, it's not going to work. And since those days, since that insight, which I think is present uh, in all sciences, in biology, of course, uh, you can look at a zebra. You see an individual zebra in a zoo, and it's an interesting creature, different from us, or a giraffe, something like that. But you don't know how they behave unless you see a whole herd of them. And you don't know what they really are and how they relate to other creatures until you've looked at their DNA. So it's going up and down in scales, length scales, time scales. You know, we go from uh, what we call a yoctosecond, 10 to the minus 24 seconds of the experiments we do here, up to cosmological times and try to go back and forth. And we've devised in the, the last decades mathematical apparatus that helps us slide very comfortably from one place to another. And sometimes the ins insights come at one scale, sometimes they come at another scale. So I think that that opening up of our, our horizons is really quite wonderful. So right now here at CERN, you know, we are at sort of the cutting edge of knowledge in particle physics, and there's a huge amount of excitement about what could be found in, the, in this year and in the following years. So if you had hopes you know, of what you would like to see happening, uh, what would they be? Well, I can tell you some of the possibilities that excite me. Uh, one that could happen any day is to find a new force of nature for which the evidence would be a new particle that is the mediator of that force. So that could happen in the strong interactions or in the weak and electromagnetic interactions. We know how you look at, look at that. It's one of the first things people do. And that, you know, to find a fifth force of nature or a sixth or seventh, that would be pretty special. It would change the way we think about the world. And the way we understand the forces of nature is that they're all related to symmetries that we've recognized in experiment. So that would be a new, new symmetry. And we try to put that together with the other symmetries. There are other symmetries that might just come on their own. So there's a famous one that's occupied many of my contemporaries for longer than they would like to admit. And that's, that's the theory called supersymmetry. It's a really wonderful idea and uh, sort of the maximal kind of symmetry that you can imagine mathematically that would relate different kinds of particles, things like the electrons and the quarks to the force particles or particles like them. No evidence for it in experiment, but it would be really sweet if it were to happen. Might give us a path toward incorporating gravitation with the other forces. So those are two things. Uh, we hope very much, so it's not out of the question, it may even be, uh, be possible, for us to find candidates for the dark matter in the universe. In our experiments here, as big as they are, they will never establish, because the flight path is limited to tens of meters, they'll never establish that a dark matter particle has a cosmological lifetime, but they might give us something that looks like it could be, and then if we discover it in another way, in direct detection or indirect detection, maybe we can put the pieces together and know a little more about what the whole world is made of. So those are just a few things that uh, would be extremely exciting. We could find compositeness of the quarks and leptons. As I say, that's an experiment that's already been, an analysis that's already being done by Atlas and CMS with the new data. So what about the future of particle physics? Where do you see this going in the next few years? So there are a couple of areas that there's exploration, looking for new things that we haven't seen before, phenomena that would change our minds about the way the world is. There are searches in which we're going after things that some theorist has imagined, maybe accurately, maybe inaccurately. And then there are measurements. Those will happen here at uh, very high energy scales, but also at low scales where we're looking at very large samples of particles that we've known for a long time and trying to get into the intimate details of their lives and deaths. Um, the other big thrust at the moment in uh, particle physics per se is in neutrino physics. Neutrinos are these uh, particles that interact only by the weak interactions, so they're very feeble interactions. They traverse large amounts of, of matter. 
Uh, and for a long time, it was a good approximation to say that they have no mass at all. We now know that that's not true and that they have the miraculous property that one flavor of neutrino going, uh, tra traversing a long distance can change into a different flavor of neutrino. So there are many experiments around the world using natural sources that have given us good insights into those. My laboratory is building a big program, an accelerator-based study of neutrino oscillations. And we don't know where that's going to lead us. We don't know, uh, neutrinos have the interesting property that of all the particles we know, they could in a certain sense be their own antiparticle. And this would give us a new way of looking at the world and a new way of thinking. We can see how many things might be connected to each other, but we don't know if they really are. So one thing that would happen if neutrinos were their own antiparticle, it might give us a new clue for why this world ends up made mostly of matter with very little antimatter. The whole story that people have constructed for that, for which again, we have no experimental evidence, but we see what we must do to build the case for it. And now it's up to nature. What about the next big machine? What do you think it's going to be? Well, we need to be thinking about the next big machine because it takes so long to plan, to develop the technology, and to construct these instruments. So a number of us uh, here in the U.S. and elsewhere are thinking about a machine, maybe an upgrade to this machine, maybe a much larger tunnel, 100, 100 kilometers around or something like that. Uh, you know, there are many projects and uh, there's a need for technology development, especially in the superconducting magnets and the detectors and so on. It's fun and it's important. It's an obligation for us to spend some part of our time on that. Uh, you know, the cathedral makers didn't always see the end of the cathedral they were, were working on, and so we have to invest something in, in machines or in other instruments that may not, may not exist while we're around. And finally, why should we build these machines? Well, we should build these machines, I think, for a number of reasons. The, the most direct one is the scientific progress that leads to a better understanding of the world. And I think if, even if we humans learn that we're not the center of the universe, it empowers us to know that we can understand things. I think that's extremely important for the human spirit. Uh, in particle physics in particular, but it's now spreading to other sciences, these undertakings become increasingly international. And so you have people whose governments don't speak to each other working together in the LHC experiments or in the experiments at Fermilab. That's a big contribution to the evolution of our species. And, you know, there are practical benefits. I, I like to say that our first product, you know, people want to know about spin-offs, what's it going to lead to. Our first product is actually people. And the people is not just the PhDs we produce in experimental physics who may do experimental particle physics forever or may not, but they're around and smart people, well-trained for 50 years to do whatever they're called to do by society and whatever moves them to do. But we also develop a cadre of uh, incredibly talented and original technicians and engineers because building these machines is so difficult. There are many problems to solve. And for me, one of the reasons to be in such a laboratory is just to be around people who can make inventions and then make them work. It's very stimulating to me, even though my own work is extremely remote from that.